Hi everyone, morning. Um, we're just waiting on a couple more people to join. Um, I'm seeing the participants literally increasing as we're as I'm speaking. We'll just wait a couple more minutes and then we will make a start um, and get started with the call. Hiya. Hi Francisco. You're joining from a um a different a different name, so it, it threw us a little bit. Am I? Oh gosh, I'm <laughs> I'm not Nicola. I think someone's forwarded me the wrong link. Uh yeah, that, that's not a disclosure I'm making here, right? <laughs> <laughs> you can change your name, Francisco, if you click on the right top hey, yeah. corner. Hey Francisco yeah. as well. Hello. <laughs> On the right corner, you can rename yourself Lips if you and, like. Uh, ellipses, yeah. Nicola's probably going to be joining this Francisco, so there you go. <laughs> At least we know you're here. Oh, Nicola's here as Nicola, so we've got two Nicolas. Ah. Francisco's stalling our identity. <laughs> Apologies. Content is my own. Will I still be able to host uh, the presentation if I'm uh, Nicola? Robin, you might be able to answer that. I have just made you a co-host. Hopefully that's popped up for you. Oh, thank you very much. No problem. Okay, we're just waiting on a couple more people. Oh, hi everyone. Hi Oz. Nice to see some familiar faces. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Where is everyone today then? Um, I'm at home, yeah. I'm sure many people possibly are. Cool. No one in a car then? In a car? Yeah, I've been in a few meetings this week where people have been uh, making their calls in, in the car. Hopefully it's taking the car, of course. <laughs> I don't know about others, but we're using Microsoft Teams and you can change the backgrounds, but some people have access to different backgrounds that others don't. And some have looked genuinely like that person is in that place. So there was one that looks a bit like a cafe that really threw me because I was like, I don't think we're supposed to be in cafes and you, look, you really look like you're in one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was just got fooled. They weren't in that Ferrari at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Robin, should, do you think we should make a start or waiting for any more people to join from a waiting room? Uh, the waiting room has slowed down a bit, so I reckon you're good to start and I'll just keep making sure people get admitted in as they pop up. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the second Connection Improvers call. We had the first one in, I believe it was you know, towards the end of March. Um, thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, so we've, Surrey and Borders, after the first call, connected with the Q community who have been helping us be able to facilitate the calls and also facilitate them with more people. Them, which is great. Um, so today's call is going to be focusing on a couple of different areas based on feedback that we had on the first call about things that people would like to focus on and connect together about. Um, also around hot topics that have been going on Twitter so that we're being responsive to that and then we've connected with colleagues and friends who are going to share um, some learning. So my name is Emma Binley, I am the Head of Participation, Experience and Improvement at Surrey and Borders. Um, and I've got members of my team, Tope and Anna, who are QI managers who are going to help with the call as well. And they're going to be managing the chat, having a look at themes that are coming up and sharing that with us. And then Robin and Stacey from Q Community are also helping us throughout the, the session, the morning, the lunch period that we're going to go over. OK, great. So we do have a hashtag set up. So if you'd like to share on Twitter, please do um, feel free to take pictures, tweet, whatever you'd like to do. So some basic, let me see if this is going to work, some basic call etiquette. So we'd like people to please mute yourselves um, and turn your video off if possible, just so that we can keep the strongest connectivity on the call going. It shouldn't be a problem. I think a lot of calls have worked with video nowadays because internet's adjusting, but just to make sure that we're okay with that, um, if you guys could follow that etiquette. If you would like to speak during the time, then please either 
if it's in the middle of a presentation, put it into the chat so we're aware that you've got a question and we can draw upon it later. Um, or if it's during a discussion session, then when you're speaking, obviously unmute yourself and turn on your video so that we can see you um, and connect with who you are as well. So hopefully we won't have any background noise and that should work. Okay, so this is the agenda of the call and what we're gonna be focusing on. So a bit of a welcome and reconnection to begin with. We're mindful that people have um, may have joined the last one, may not have joined the last ones. So we just wanna connect people together. The reprioritization -prior section is around spending time reflecting on what people are working on at the moment. We're mindful that when obviously we're in a really different situation at the minute, we're facing new circumstances. Um, it's probably the biggest complex problem we've ever faced as improvers. So there's an element of excitement as well of how we help support that and overcome that. Um, but trying to connect together around what people are working on. So are you still working in an improvement role? Is your improvement team still supporting improvement projects? Or are you now, have you been redeployed like many of us have? I've been redeployed twice and kind of now in a half redeployed not redeployed role so um, I can definitely talk about my experience as can others um, and are you actually using improvement work to help solve the problem of COVID and sharing that so that's the reprioritization section and then we've seen a lot on Twitter had a lot of comments a lot of feedback and it was a hot topic on our first call around virtual training and how do we transition training from being face-to-face -face training to fit a virtual world which we now are all many of us working in um, and we don't know how long we could be working in that way but also actually what what do we need in virtual training is it as simple as trans moving our face-to-face -face training to virtual training or is there actually around thinking the need may be different in a virtual world and what people ask or would like or what we need to do and deliver may be slightly different during this COVID period so that's what that discussion is going to be about. And we've been joined by some of my old colleagues from ELFT, um, in where I used to work, and um, some of my colleagues currently from Surrey and Borders. And Lou Walters is also going to share some work that she's been doing around virtual training. So we're going to have some presentations around sharing learning, um, but then we're going to have some open discussion about it. Um, and in the art of using QI, we're going to do a force field analysis tool online to try and share some of the driving and restraining forces around how we move training into the virtual world. And then following on from the requests on the first call was one thing we reflected on was that many of us would have gone to different conferences in, during this year so far. Many of us were probably signed up to go to the IHI conference. Many of us may have had other events and opportunities to network. And at the moment, those events aren't taking place. So how do we keep that network in time alive? How do we keep that connection alive as like-minded improvers? So some real open network in time. We've did some, with the registration, we asked some questions around things that people would like to focus on. So we can tailor some of that conversation around the things that people have come forward with. So that's the agenda. Um, hopefully we'll be able to fit it all within the time and I will do my best so please feel free to help me with my timekeeping. So what we would like you guys to do in the chat box is um, please introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit more about your current role, where you're jo joining from, um, what you're currently working on, have you, like I said, are you still doing improvement work, are you doing it but slightly different, are you working in a different team temporarily, um, I know that many clinicians have been redeployed back into frontline clinical roles, um, has that role now changed back? So yeah, we'd like to learn a little bit about more, a little more about who's on the call. Um, and this is gonna show my Zoom skills. I don't think I can see the chat while sharing my screen. So if maybe Robin or Stacey and or Toppe, if you guys would be happy to share some of the comments coming into the chat, that would be really great. Thank you. So I've got Nicola Davy talking about how they've taken their blended learning completely virtual at the moment. Also some lovely comments about uh, the great representation from across the UK. So we've got a real variety of locations here. So hopefully a great variety of experience and how things are going. 
I wonder I mean, if you're happy to share about some of your experiences with taking it virtually. Hmm. Relaunching with e-learning, looks great. We've got some call in a while where we can obviously share the learning directly about the, the virtual learning, but it's great to see that so many people are already, that's already a hot topic and already connect, forming that connection, which is fantastic. Mm. I think there's also um, people on different kind of stages of their journey. Some, some people who are actually new in post, so they're grappling with this for the first mm. time looking to be here to learn learn from others and take it back which is great others thinking about video consultations um, and we can link in some of the work we're doing with Q on that um, yeah a whole range of things Michelle I can Michelle from Milton Keynes I feel like a radio host saying it like that sorry Michelle Dowling um, uh, I can definitely relate I'm currently also sitting between doing some redeployed work but also trying to fit back into my my full-time previous role and how the two two link um, so yeah definitely join you on that one a few teams been redeployed for PPE hubs we see mm. And I imagine, and I might be wrong, but I imagine there has been a huge amount of rapid cycle testing around PPE use, um, distribution, and I think there was so much learning around the changes in guidance and how we make sure we're always aligned with that um, as well. Oh, interesting. Interesting. About, oh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, sorry, Emma. Um, there's some stuff on here as well about programs that have been uh, hibernated and I guess people mm. might be thinking about how those are bought are bought back and what some of the implications are and things that we need to they need to think through um, some of that might come out in in some of the conversation later yeah that was definitely on the registration one of the themes that was um, quite strong was around how do we recover from this situation so actually how do we go back to support and improvement projects how do we um, try to think of the right word I don't want to say unhibernate but how do we move from hibernating <laughs> Uh, QI projects and QI programs and build things back um, but also how do we adjust to a new norm because we're not going to necessarily go back to exactly how things were before. So re reactivating. Thank you. <laughs> I got there in the end. So when we come to the open discussion later, it would be really great to hear um, from those teams that have had their QI programs hibernated, that process and how that sort of went and what your plan is to recover from that. Because I think there'll be some great learning for others. Um, in Surrey and Borders, we, we haven't hibernated our QI project program, but we have definitely um, been able to support less quality improvement work and um, supporting quality improvement in a different way. So I know that we've obviously got learning that we can share, but it'd be great to, to hear from other people. Okay, so that in mind, maybe it looks like we've got loads of people who have joined us, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and we will move on to the next part of the agenda. So. Virtual training. So in this section, we've got um, some learning from two people formally, but then also Lou Walters is going to share some work that she's been doing um, more recently since we set up the slides. Um, so we're joined by colleagues from East London NHS Foundation Trust. Um, I think there's quite a few of you on the call that are going to share the presentation between yourselves and Francisco is going to manage the screen in a few moments. And they're going to talk to us about how they made their pocket QI course virtual. Um, which I used to help teach that. So I'm really keen to learn about that. I'm really fascinated by it. Um, but I know that many others are because when the conversation about virtual training has been happening on Twitter, there's been a lot of reference to um, Pocket QI. So we're definitely really grateful to have the opportunity to learn from you guys and share that wider. Um, and then my colleagues, Emily and Tope are gonna to talk through how we've made and adapted our suicide prevention training to a virtual world. So although it's not quality improvement training, um, it's training that we deliver within our team because we're using quality improvement methods um, to help reduce the number of people dying by suicide and the risk. Um, 
so yeah they're going to talk through some of slightly more earlier stages but some of the changes and adaptations i've had to make to content and things to make it suit virtual um because the training face to face is a really interactive training so making sure we don't lose that workshop side of things and then i'm also going to then pass the screen on to well i'm going to share the screen on behalf of lou who's going to talk through a fish fish bone diagram that she's put together around virtual training and how we transition to that and she's going to talk through some of that work before we move on to the driver diagram. So if Francisco you should now be able to hand over be able to share your screen. So uh, PDSA is in action this is the first time I've used Zoom in this kind of way so <laughs> don't worry me this too. Pretty much, well this is the thing right it's all learning and this pretty much underpins what we've been we've been uh, doing actually so let me see if I've got the right let's see so hopefully you'll be able to see my screen going virtual. Hooray, so that's a, that's a successful first test. Um, let's see if it continues. Um, thank you so much, Emma, and uh, for inviting us here. It's just great. We're, we're really here to learn as well. So we've not had a great opportunity to learn from other teams around delivering virtual. We're only starting to do that now. And we're very keen to think about some of the key elements that, that you've raised already. Um, but this is our story it's an ongoing story we're continuing to learn from each other uh, a lot of this will be about how we've actually tried to quite rapidly understand how to use the platforms available to us um we'll talk a little bit about content uh, going forward let's just see if we can did that move to the next slide yes yeah Good. Uh, uh, we, need, we need this feedback. PDSA is in action. So, um, so we're just going to give a little bit of a brief intro to uh, Elf uh, Pocket QI for those of you who um, don't know very much about it. We'll then talk about the challenge. I mean, we literally had almost a week, less than a week, to turn a workshop into a virtual workshop presentation and be thinking about how we'd want to do that and some of the key things that we wanted to retain and have with that. Um, we're going to talk about our three cycles uh, of PDSAs, multiple PDSAs within each of those cycles. We're going to be discussing that and then we'll be looking at the next steps. And in the true spirit of QI, I'll be handing over to my colleagues. I should have mentioned them right from the start. So we have here from the QI team, Marco Aurelio, who is one of our improvement advisors. Do you say hello, Marco? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Awesome. Good stuff. Good to see you. Uh, and uh, Marco was involved really was tasked uh, to start helping think about in the very short period of time converting some of the content for the module he was due to deliver face to face uh, so he's got a lot of experience ongoing as well in terms of how to develop some of this content to into a virtual platform and Nicola is also here another one of our um, private advisors morning nice to see everyone uh, I was involved in teaching the the second and third tests of our PDSAs. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, and uh, Shubs, are you here? Shubs, you're on mute. Okay. Hi, sorry, I was just, uh, you know, we have different ways of using the laptop, so I'm just getting used to the function. So, hello, everyone. Uh, just some, well, um, so the IHI have this thing called um, platform bingo and one of the things that you want to score is whether someone is saying are you on mute so it's bound to happen at least once if not multiple times uh, during these things we might think about that as a warm-up exercise going forward so Shub's great great to see you here and myself Francisco Frasquillo I'm uh, yeah one of the senior improvement advisors here I'm a Q as well um, I've basically been supporting and looking at the development of our training primarily Pocket QI, but we're also looking at the um, Improvement Coaches Programme, which we're thinking about how we're going to work with that if that goes virtual. So, without further ado, I'll pass on to Shubs. You wanted to... You're yeah, going to hi, about hi, the introduction of this. I hope, I hope everyone can hear me this time. So, yeah, so, you know, um, of all the virtual platforms out there, I think Zoom was the only one that I hadn't tried. So <laughs> today was about learning within the five minutes that I did to sign up uh, as early as I could. So, yeah, for me, I'm the training and program support officer within the team, and I kind of lead on um, the technical aspects and, and the support within the support team for the department. So that's with other uh, trainings, but Pocket QI is like my bread and butter, if you like. 
So um, just to tell you a little brief about it. So what is Pocket QI? Pocket QI is our um, introduction to quality improvement. And it's where we allow service users, carers from ELF and anybody who's got a keen interest in learning what quality, quality improvement actually is. So before, before it went virtual, so it was two half day uh, classroom sessions uh, for two weeks apart. So we'll be doing it in part one and part two and people can have the, the choice of doing it um, anytime. So you can either complete module one at, at some stage and then module two at another stage. Um, but normally it's within the month you have both modules available to you. So it's based on the model for improvements, so M MFI, and uh, based on the ELF five-step sequence of improvement. So it's basically what we'll do first of all is we'll introduce um, the guys to what QI actually is, um, show them how to identify a quality issue, um, maybe understand their problems. Um, so as usual, developing a strategy, um, you know, to to the best of their understanding. So it doesn't go too much into depth, but it's whatever anybody can understand. So then it's tense testing and implementing and sustaining the gains. So, and then the last step is showing them how to go to quality control to, to, to an extent. So the lockdown challenge, this is, you know, as, as everyone knows in the QI team, a challenge is, is something we love. We thrive on this. So, you know, uh, so the team decided to test turning our planned classroom workshops into virtual offerings. And I tell you what, it's, it's at that point where I sat there and I went, oh boy, you know, it's just, it's just when you don't know because everything is going to be new. We're going to have to do rapid cycles on this and just see what happens. So obviously like Marco and, and a few others had the task of modifying and developing the content as rapidly as possible. So that was to get whatever they already had um, to then chop and, and get everything to, to an extent where we can de deliver this virtually to, uh, as quickly as possible. For me, <laughs> it was learn how to use a virtual platform like WebEx and, and the challenge was trying to deliver that as, as best possible in a training manner rather than just saying, hey, attend a meeting. So sort of like this where you're coming onto Zoom and you're, you're trying to get that experience of a training session. Then um, I think we, we had just over a week to, to get all this sorted. So for me, my main task was to support the IAs to deliver the content using a new medium. So it was to go and study new platforms, um, see what's best available out there. So there were, there were so many which, which I came up with and I was just like, oh guys, I don't know what to do here. So it's just one of those things where we sat down and we said, okay, let's test. So we, we set up. So myself and Francisco, it was said it so many times when I would call Francisco and say, yeah, have you got five minutes? And it turns into 45 minutes. So we're trying to figure out what this platform actually are. So obviously we went through cycle one, cycle two and cycle three, which my colleague Nikola and Marco will be covering. So, uh, and that's it from me. So I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. So thank you. You're on mute, Francisco. Yep, yep, just trying to get the taskbar to come up. So <laughs> it was hiding away. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, Rubes. Here's the thing, we didn't have very much time to, to be uh, thinking about the first PDSA. We literally, I think it was just about a week. And uh, hats off to Marco and Susan and Sarah and others who are really working hard to be thinking about what can we realistically deliver in, in the, the time that we have using the platform that we chose. So we chose WebEx because we have a license for it, we can go with it, we had some familiarity with it from past experiences, uh, but we didn't really know the limitations of it. So we had to really test this out uh, prior to our first live session. But these were some of the principles we really wanted to apply to when we were developing both this and the ongoing content. We wanted and needed it to be understandably as interactive as possible. Now, how do we be interactive over virtual platform. So we really had to scratch our heads around that. Uh, we wanted to mix it up so that people who are basically sitting down for up to three and actually as later PDSAs developed up to six hours with breaks, um, I had a mixture of different kinds of experiences. So not just presentations, but videos, exercises, chat, really powerful function uh, used virtually. We really kind of made a that the focus of a lot of our exercise and um, animations in the slides just to break up any particular monotony you might have of just staring at a screen for that long. The importance of frequent breaks we've mentioned already uh, and really to be seeing this as an ongoing learning experience in the true spirit of the improvement framework to be getting feedback 
to live run PDSAs. We live run one at the last session where we actually just trying to get a sense of how we could share screens backwards and forwards more rapidly across presenters rather than having one presenter holding the screen uh, and so forth. So we really wanted to, even in the breaks, are thinking what can we test out next? Just some of the limitations we had, uh, obviously we, we're using standard WebEx, so there's no breakout rooms, no easy way of doing that. So we want to be a bit creative going forward in the next test around that. Um, we also weren't very familiar, not all of us have presented virtually. So part of the aim is to get all the IAs really up to understanding the limitations and the way that they could use the system in favor of presenting a, a virtual QI. And we really didn't have very much time. We've got more time now, but we're actually now on a pretty much a two week testing schedule. So uh, every two weeks, we're looking at another workshop. And we're trying to build in learning as we go along. We'll talk more about that as we go through the presentation. So this is just a quick oversight um, of just to give you a sense of what we cover. Uh, the, the main features of Pocket QI by module, our introduction, understanding the problem, Exactly what Shubh's uh, mentioned in terms of the, the five-step quality improvement model that we use here at ELF, and a little bit more detail around uh, some of the content. And you can see we've had to introduce a whole bunch of new sections. We also use this as an opportunity to introduce sections that we felt would benefit and uh, people have given us feedback around. So we've introduced a section on how to use WebEx, that was pretty essential. Um, extended our aspect of systems thinking to incorporate a slightly more detailed approach to lens of profound knowledge which cuts across all our content we've introduced a section on the psychology of change framework uh, we expanded our process mapping to look at other forms of understanding tools five wise fish bones cause and effect diagrams we removed some things that we just knew we couldn't do at the moment uh, such as uh, nominal group technique and affinity we started to think about how to use chat channels to 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 get uh, teams to bring themes together and um, uh, Nicola will hopefully talk a bit more about that later on and some of the other standard aspects and as we went along we refined and added clarifications where needed from the feedback that we received we had to say goodbye to Mr Potato Head very sadly because um, Mr Potato Head does not translate very well virtually uh, and we're still thinking about that. That's one of the questions we really want some some, uh, some ideas around, is how to bring virtual games around PDSA. We have looked at a worked example, so we introduced that and adjusted that from our previous content. People could be seeing what a PDSA would look like. Um, we adapted our run charts to make it a little bit more accessible. So rather than having people walk around a room, we basically had people guided through some questions and a bit of a, a run chart quiz. So we, 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 we changed, could change quite a lot and uh, we're continuing to change. So we're continuing to learn. So we're on our third, fourth cycle coming up next week. And I'll hand over now to uh, Marco, who is going to give us a little bit of a sense of the learning from the first cycle. A lot of this was technical, actually. This was about gremlins um, haunting us badly throughout the whole of that experience and how we learned how to, to work with those gremlins and make our, them our friends. Uh, Marco, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Francisco. Um, yeah, it was about gremlins, but it was also about um, having two of us actually uh, down. So I, I actually wasn't there. I came down with potentially coronavirus, who knows? Um, and then another member of staff as well. So we, we actually were two members of the team down who were meant to teach that day. So Francisco and the rest of the guys had to nobly step up and present quite a, quite a long session of content. But so our kind of first test of virtual pocket QI was um, on the 25th of March, and we tested it over one half day, so it's about four hours. Um, we had 30 delegates that attended, um, which is roughly what we'd expect from an in-person um, session, so that was fantastic. Um, and kind of you can see down the bottom there, we sort of themed our main learning that came out of that session um, around these three areas. So technology, how we actually went about organizing the session, and then how we actually went about facilitating the session. So you can see here, I won't read through all of these, um, in detail but if you wanted to look a bit more about this test in particular we've written it up um, as a PDSA and we can share that link there but it's underneath the um, the title of this slide um, but I think really kind of the key learning here was um, how do we manage the technology and and just as you guys have kind of done on this call we, we had a tech facilitator and that was that was really important for us um, to just to take care of all of the the kind of back-end technology stuff um, 
you know, that person also does a how to use WebEx. We're using WebEx um, session at the beginning of Pocket QI for those people that are, are sort of unfamiliar with, with the technology, um, which, which is really important for us. Um, and I guess moving to kind of towards the facilitation of sessions, um, we felt it was really, really important to um, actually make it quite clear um, what each of the facilitators and team members' roles from the QI team were on the call. So people were kind of clear who to direct questions to. And again, just like on, on this call, we've got people um, looking at the, the kind of chat um, to, to notice any questions that are sort of coming up. Because um, that's quite hard to do in WebEx, particularly where you've only got one screen, you can't see all of the chats that are coming up. So we would have another facilitator actually just um, looking at the chats and kind of responding to questions or asking the actual main facilitator to pause and actually have a look at some of those questions and actually um, talk to them a little bit more. So that was kind of um, the main learning from our, our sort of first test here, really. Um, so Francisco, you want to just move the slides on? Fab. So we, as Francisco said, we, we're quite lucky that we have quite a rapid throughput of people um, that, that actually attend our course. And, and we're, we're sort of seeing about 80 people, 60 to 80 people every month. So we're running it twice, uh, twice a month, every fortnight. So we decided then what would happen if rather than doing a half a day session, so half of the, half of the content, um, what happens if we just did all of the content, the, the entire two modules in a whole day? Um, and I'm not going to lie, that filled me with uh, some sense of trepidation. Uh, I was a bit worried. Oh, my goodness, what, what is going to happen here? Um, so really, we were kind of looking, would it be feasible to actually do a pocket QI in a whole one day webinar? Um, and so we've got some questions down here at the bottom that we were particularly interested in, in actually finding out from this particular test. And so we had 39 delegates on this, on this particular call. Um, and it was two weeks after the, after the test we did on the 25th of March. And so we were kind of looking at, would we be able to retain all of the delegates throughout the, the day? Would, would, they, would they just be overloaded and just drop off? Um, what actually would they be experiencing uh, as part of that one day virtual workshop? Would it be too much for them? Would, would it really impact their, their learning experience? And then again, what actually would the experience of the facilitators be? We're quite lucky that we have quite a, a good number of um, IAs and people that can teach this, um, which puts us, puts us in quite a, a nice position. But um, there are again, a very uh, kind of varying abilities and, and comfortablenesses in terms of the tech and the content. So what was the experience of the facilitators here? Do you wanna move us on, Francisco? Thanks. So here's what happened. So we, we ran that kind of session. Um, so we actually only had 28 delegates that actually signed up to the, to the course. And for one reason or another, we had uh, 11 surprise delegates um, and 29 people remained on the call for the whole day. And actually the feedback was really, really positive. Um, I don't actually know if it's, if it's better than we'd actually get in person, but it's definitely in line with what we would experience when we're doing in-person sort of um, webinars. Um, uh, but I think probably more important is down the bottom there, we've got some kind of qualitative feedback from that particular session. Um, and largely, we can kind of see that there were some really positive things. But I think the thing that we're still learning and trying to work through, as you can see from those comments there, is how actually do we not make this just quite a didactic presentation? Um, how do we actually make it interactive? Um, how do we actually make it feel collaborative there? And there are some 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 quite nice comments there. Um, you know, making use of virtual breakout rooms would have been useful. Um, getting people into little little groups. Um, and with our version of WebEx, it's quite difficult to do that. But um, we I, I, we we have begun to think about how we can do that and, and run a small test on how we do that this week um, with another group. Um, and again, I think people when they come to Pocket QI, one of the, the really great things about um, in person is, is they get to see people that they may not have seen for quite a long time. They get to see work with people who might be in their services that, you know, they, they wouldn't actually get that much time to, to spend thinking through how do we make an improvement to our service um, when they're doing the day to day job. So actually our, our challenge going forward is how do we make this as interactive and as collaborative as possible? Guys from from Elf, is there anything else to add there? Or should we move on to Nicola Francisco? I'm just, uh, there's great comments coming out on the chat um, and lots of things that we can look into. I, I've never heard of Miro, uh, be very keen to be looking at that. Um, we're just keeping record now. I'll pass on to Nicola now if you're okay to. 
Just to let you guys know, I'm making note of questions, so uh, you can obviously ask them Brilliant. towards the end. And if you're answering them in your presentation, then I'm making notes so that you guys are aware. Brilliant. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that. So um, our third test we ran last week. And we notice a lot of people saying it's exhausting doing a whole day staring at the screen. So we thought we could offer it um, short as a whole day, but also with the option for people to join in the morning and then come again two weeks later for the afternoon session. Um, so we thought well, we'll just send one calendar invite for this and see if, if people can just join us at 1 p.m. And that got a little confusing. So when we do it next week, we've sent two separate calendar invites. Then people can see they've got the option to leave and come back. Um, and they've got a, a nice a long lunch break in the middle, that's clear. Now, we, we've, we've been using normal WebEx, but we've tested as well using the WebEx training platform. And that's mostly, like Marco said, because people really wanted to do uh, breakout rooms. And it's really smooth for handing control over to each other and things. We tested it in our team and it was easy um, from our side of things, but we couldn't, like, the delegates couldn't write in the chat box, uh, they couldn't unmute themselves, so it was just really one way. Um, we know really it was important for, for people to be doing exercises and be engaging in it, so uh, we decided not to use that WebEx training platform, gone back to the regular um, platform that we'd used before. Um, We've also, we, we tried to improve some of the content judging by the feedback that we got from people. And it's not like when you get feedback in a room, we didn't get much detail, just a, just a short comment about um, needing more information on drive diagrams, for example. So we, we, we kind of uh, tried to meet those needs and we, looked, we asked quite specific feedback after each session as to what you'd like to use in practice, what tools would you like to know more and less of and things. So that's how we kind of judge how our content's going. And we also wondered, starting, starting last month, if we could do this every fortnight, that people are working from home, it seemed like um, a good time for, for uh, the offer of virtual training. And sure, we had, again, 35 delegates just two weeks after the previous time. So um, it turned out to be, to be really popular. Two weeks is just about the most that we, we thought we could manage as a team because we you know we are iterating each time and we want to sometimes make big changes we've realized we might have to just aim for the session a month in advance if we're doing anything that, that we can't quite change in, in a couple of weeks francisco can we see the next slide please okay so so this is our feedback we had um about two-thirds of the people stay for the morning so we're hoping next week they're going to sign up to the afternoon session um and it's it's much easier easier as well for us as as teachers just to come in for a shorter period of time. Teaching all day was exhausting, uh, so we just take a module each now. And some of the feedback that, that you can see there in quotes, uh, people really enjoyed just the change in um, in the way that things were presented. They enjoyed the examples. Um, we worked some through some examples clinically and some, some that were just re really easy to um, put into driver diagrams as we went along through the training and they also appreciated the videos. I, I, liked, I liked this, somebody said that it's just easier to contribute virtually than in real life because you, you don't need to wait for your turn to chat, you can just put it in the box and uh, we had somebody monitoring the chat box all the time so we could get back to everybody. So hopefully this virtual platform means that we can kind of hear those more quiet voices. Uh, we did get asked uh, for whether the content could be used for people's live projects. So we, it, this is tricky because we do have some people who aren't working on projects while others um, have something live to work on. So that's something we'd, we'd really like to work on. And the breakout rooms would be really important um, in that. And loads of the comments, I suppose, were just about the characters that who were delivering the training and it's just you know to keep people's attention online it's got to be fun it's got to be silly um there was a lot of laughter when those tech gremlins came up we just kind of we just said it and um although we were so nervous about the tech going wrong at the beginning everyone understood um it's new to us as a as a species so i i think that we were kind of really supported um 
when things went wrong. But it, it was really valuable to have the, the tech team there so that people could ask them when they had, their connection wasn't so good. Um, so that was, that was really appreciated. And I suppose because it has been such a challenge and you feel a bit like you're, you're on stage like we are now, uh, it really brought the team together. We, we um, needed to support each other quite a lot and, and we had a lot of fun. Um, Francisca, it's back over to you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think one of the things we've learned from working from home virtually is that the, the connections that we build up anyway uh, across teams. I think we had a mixture of people relatively new to the team, people who have been here for a long time. Um, so this was just a great way of bringing them together and actually getting that, um, that, that creativity going. So. This is just some examples of uh, the slides and just really kind of three areas that we, we continue to want to be focusing on. General orientation, how to get people using WebEx and the tool. And I, I should say that we're, we're still looking at WebEx training. Um, it was the MS Teams live events that we just didn't feel was in any way suitable for, for this kind of, uh, well, at least the, the level we had it switched on to. So we are looking at uh, potential breakout rooms and other things that we can use. So we're evolving that. This is just some of the examples of some of the questions you might want to that we have used to get people just to give their ideas to be more interactive and actually that came up really strongly um, most people really enjoyed using the chat box and felt that this was a way that sometimes when they wouldn't be talking out in uh, in a workshop setting they were able to communicate in the different we wanted to have uh, lots of interactions there you, uh, so here are some of the examples just put stuff in the chat box. Well, let's have a look at some of the themes. Uh, and Nicola, you came up with this idea. Did you want to just say a little bit about this, uh, the driver diagram? Uh, we're playing around with ways of being kind of live and interactive. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, so we, we had already um, been asking people to come up with ideas for um, and aim primary drivers and change ideas and so on. So then it just helped to be able to put that into a driver diagram live. Uh, so it was a bit fiddly, we had to um, come out of the presenter mode so that we can edit the driver diagram. But I, th I think people just a lot more engaged in it than if we had already sort of pre-filled pre it in. Um, so then we filled it out live and went back into presenter mode. Somebody on the chat box has said um, that they use an Excel document to, to do that and that it might be smoother. So I'd really appreciate if you could share that with us, please. Be brilliant, brilliant learning, thank you. Um, and these are just some examples of the of our data section. Uh, we'd have a, a bit of a quiz. We have a number of different run charts, and where we ask people to identify rules, and we just sequentially do this. Um, and actually, people really engaged in this. We had a little. Uh, it's an animated version of how to work out runs and why runs are important, and how we differentiate between runs and non-runs. So we just wanted to be creative around this, and we got quite a lot positive feedback around that aspect. So what are our next steps? Well, and I can just see the rich comments that have come through in the chat box today. Lots of things to be thinking around and ways of developing connection and using the platforms to their fullest, but also being creative around that. We want to be thinking about the interactive exercises. So we looked maybe, we had a look at Mural. We played around with MS Teams whiteboards, but MS Teams isn't ideal for this kind of framework. We're thinking about using Mentimeter surveys and other ways of doing this, just to get that feel, that raw feel of doing normal group technique and affinity work, which is missing to some extent uh, virtually. And we're really pretty much there in training up all the IAs, not so much around the content because they know it, but to use this. Once you're actually much more familiar with the platform, it's easier to actually start to, to swim and uh, not feeling that there's a risk of sinking and actually the confidence is there and then it becomes much more of an engaging process. So thank you so much uh, for your time. I think we, apologies Emma if I've um, kind of caused you any anxiety of going over time. I'm not quite sure how long we've had but hopefully that's been a fruitful um, sharing. Certainly just brilliant to see some of the recommendations come up in the chat as well. We're more than happy to answer questions uh, as needed, but I'll, I'll hand you back over to Emma. And thanks very much from the LQI team for having us here today. Thanks Francisco, Marco, Shubs and Nicola for that um, presentation. That's fantastic. You're actually all right for time because we started early as well. So 
It's all good, don't worry. My anxiety's fine. Um, most of the questions have actually been answered during the presentation, so um, which is fantastic and great. Um, amazing learning, so thank you guys so much. What we're going to do as well after the call is do a sort of a summary blog so actually we can share the learning so people can obviously listen to the call but also get a bit of a, a read. So I think that I know that for my team we've definitely benefited from hearing about what you guys have done um, and I'm sure from the chats and the comments others have. One of the questions that hasn't been answered um, that came up was around, um, so you spoke about the uptake being really similar to the uptake previously, um, but people were saying actually, was it challenging to get people back for the second part? So people that left the first part, so they maybe did half the day or one of the modules, was there a challenge in re-engaging those people? I don't, uh, I'll, I'll take this one. Uh, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. I think, um, I think actually most of the, I think we did have some dropout, but um, probably when we look at the dropout, particularly when we did it over over a whole day, that was probably the surprise people. And I actually think the surprise people were from a from an external group that I'm currently working with. So they, they've got their own pocket QI, but it was more like, if you want to come and just have a bit of a top up, um, then um, feel free. It, we didn't find it was actually that difficult. The dropout was not that not that much. So what one thing as well to top up on Marcus' point is, so I'll be managing the delegates, so sending out invitations and things like that. So what we discovered was because we was using um, Microsoft Forms, we was able to see the signups and, and see what the changes were. So a lot of the time, people who had already signed up for the face-to-face uh, -face sessions, when we told them um, we're going virtual, it, it felt like good news to them because it was accessible. So a lot of the time when we're trying to deliver training is so that people can match their directorates or it's locally available to them. But being virtual, a lot of people had actually said, oh, I'd really like to sign up for that, actually. So, yeah. yeah, that was one of the one of the comments in the chat was actually around, have we now made training more accessible to people as opposed to us feeling like it's less accessible, um, which is great. OK, thank you, guys. Thank you so much for sharing um, your learning. And I'm sure that many people probably have more comments and questions for you. So, guys, please feel free to keep asking them in the chat and um, the team from ELF will be able to connect with you about that. So thank you guys. I'm just going to quickly share, work out how to reshare my screen. Um, I may need help from Robin, but let me see if I can do it. And it seems to have worked. Perfect. Great. I feel so proud of myself. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to um, Tope and Emily who work in my team. So we're going to talk a bit about how they are, they're in the process, I think they've finished it now, but not delivered it yet. So slightly different position to where ELF directs. We haven't actually tested out the delivery, but we've been testing out the developing it. So um, turning our face-to-face -face suicide prevention training to fit the virtual world. So Emily and Tope, are you on the call? Unable yeah, to I'm here. Hello, everybody. Nice to see everyone. Yeah. Um, hi. Yes. Yeah, so my name's Emily Floyd. I'm uh, the suicide prevention trainer and facilitator at Surrey and Borders Trust. Um, and really what we, what we deliver at the moment, what we have been delivering is a full day's training um, in suicide prevention aimed at the clinicians who work within our trust. Um, we also offer training through the Recovery College, which is um, a four week programme with two hour weekly modules. Um, and we also offer sessions for GPs as well, kind of a, a shorter bite-sized version, if you like, um, to train GPs within Surrey as well. So we're very much in the early stages. Um, we've had redeployment in our team and kind of been quite overwhelmed with what's been going on. So our kind of thinking really at the moment is safety. Um, more than ever now with the response to the COVID, um, people are more risky. Um, people within the workplace need support. And how do we kind of get the training to the clinicians. Um, we also have an online module, which is called, we need to talk about suicide. Um, and that has been a mandatory training requirement for, it was signed off last year by the board. And we've now kind of been pushing for that really to make sure that that's actually reflected in everyone's profile on their ESR. So for every trust member, so that they know that that is there, that is there for them to use to, um, and to support them in this time and to kind of develop um, their learning around that also. Um, we also were thinking about actually we need to we, we don't know how long this is going to happen um, we don't know how long we're going to be in this kind of virtual world so what do we do um sorry also i'll go back to actually what's on the screen now the infographic so anna smith very kindly supported us 
to get this infographic put together. Um, and this really is something that we are rolling out across the trust um, as a very quick tool for people to look at that can support people and signpost them really to what they need um, from a staff perspective and from a clinical perspective, kind of, you know, making those skills transferable. So really what we are now, we kind of, we offer the full day training, as I said, which is a, it is a full, very full on day um, with videos um, around risk assessment um, and break offs within the room. So table discussions, table talk discussions among people. So we're like, how, how do we do this? What do we do? So we're still very much in the development stage. Um, the ideas that we have so far, so we're thinking that we break the content down and we've broken this down into module part one, module A and B, and part two. Um, so our challenges have been really, how do we make sure that we keep the right content? Um, what, you know, what can we trim down? And really, we, uh, the safety, the safety of people attending the training. So that's been a real kind of issue for us. We're kind of grappling with it at the moment. So what we've decided to do, as I said, break it down part one, A and B, and then a part two. Um, and again, I, I've, as you discussed over Al, how do you keep people engaged? How, how do you um, not have somebody bored looking at the screen all day? So we have part one. Um, within that, we're going to kind of make that a transferable, um, kind of more basic skills that we could actually roll out for, for everybody to use. And then part two, maybe the more in-depth sort of focus on the services that we provide. So looking at children, young people services, learning disability services, and actually having case, case studies and scenarios within that. Um, so we're thinking then how do we best manage that? So we're thinking of creating a Teams channel where people can go and access the case studies, take some time to reflect, digest the learning um, and, and what, they, what they've learned, and what they need and have a live chat that's kind of always, always um, open on there and access the work and the case studies. And then we were thinking, um, maybe we're not sure frequency yet because we're not sure how it will go, kind of maybe once enough offering a virtual Zoom call like this um and calling it like a spin-off session from the training so it, the idea that people can go away it's a pre-recorded part one and two um training and they can access it whenever they want to from their from their laptops and then come together once a month and have a discussion about what they've learned um, and really share the learning together with the case studies and everything um we're thinking we're having our first test today later on this afternoon where we have our content we've trimmed it down and we're going to try a podcast style and um, with top a and myself to talk, um, talk about the training with using a PowerPoint slide as well. Um, keeping the videos in to keep that interactive element um, and keeping you know, uh, pauses for reflection and assessment so people can actually take the time to conduct their risk assessment, put them together. Um, and then as I say, come together maybe once a month, however, however it works, we're still very much in the development stage um, and share their learning. Um, we, there's also ideas I've been linking with the National Suicide Prevention Agency to see how other people are manage it, managing it nationally. Um, and there's ideas about, you know, how do we guarantee people's safety um, or how do we best support people um, being safe? So there's kind of delegate agreements that have been drawn up um, to, that people can sign to say um, if they feel safe, kind of like um, making sure cameras are on all the times and things like that. So with the, we have, there's a basic one we're looking at and we're thinking how, how do we adapt that to our learning? Um, and ensure the safety of people. But anyway, I'll, you, I'll hand over to you. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, that's just some ideas, and hopefully next one we'll, we can uh, feed back and give you, give you some of our progress. Brilliant. Thanks, Emily. Um, so I, there's not a great deal to add to Emily, but I guess um, kind of framing it in, in terms of a, a quality improvement project that we, we're testing out right now. Um, if I just kind of backtrack and just introduce myself. So I'm a uh, QI manager in, in the SOBP. And part of my role involves helping our trust to implement the suicide prevention strategy. Uh, and a huge part of that is around helping um, our clinicians and all trust uh, staff members to improve their competencies and skills around suicide prevention. Um, so obviously, the, you know, I think we're all in the same boat in terms of the challenge that is presented to us by the lockdown. Um, we we are conscious pre the lockdown, we, we also had challenges around uptake and, uh, and maximizing people's use. So the, people, the clinicians who need the training don't always access the training. Um, we're conscious that it was a whole day's training we now have to try to, to deliver. Um, we are uh, we, we're taking learning from um, other areas. So um, Emily mentioned 
been in contact with the National Suicide Prevention Alliance um, and some of the learning there and uh, what the conversation and narrative has been around how people can concentrate for a long period of time. So something this intense, you need to be able to maintain people's safety. Um, so how can we do condense all of that into a couple of hours um, so that you don't lose the content, but you keep people safe and you keep their attention going. So Emily's talked a little bit about the resources we've created um, and you know we're now in a virtual world um, and space so we need to harness and use the opportunities that we we're finding in the trust. Um, I'm sure other trusts and other services and areas are, are learning that um, we are using more technology now so we, we need to kind of roll with the changes so to speak. Um, so a few things we, Emily's already mentioned, we are uh, setting up a, uh, we use Microsoft Teams, so we're going to be setting up a Microsoft Teams challenge, uh, challenge, not a challenge, channel, um, where we will upload a number of resources that we're going to be taking out of the full day's training so that they're still accessible. Um, so we have a challenge to be able to find how people are interacting, how people are using that, um, and, and whether this is actually uh, making a difference and, and making an impact. Um, so I'm, we're conscious that we're going to be creating a video resource which uh, individuals will be expected to access by themselves and, and we can't see what that feels like and what that's like and whether um, it's a bit like you know with an e-learning training are, are, are you just going to be watching it fast forwarding and just not really taking, taking it on board. But we know that this is a real need for people. This is, you know, the, the impact of COVID is beyond the physical. We know that um, people's risks are increased um, right now. And so we hope that the, the content will be accessed and will be digested. Um, but as Emily said, we will be offering um, uh, an hour sort of virtual call um, to have a space to reflect on, on the issues from the training, the learning from there, and, and to bring people back together. Um, before we started looking at um, what we're going to do and how we're going to change um, or adapt our, our training, we, we came up with the ideas and we tested the idea out um, and you know, asking people what really mattered to them about this. Um, and Emily has stressed uh, the safety is, is of greatest importance to people. But also being able to learn together, um, that was really important to, to a lot of our teams. And as I said, also the urgency of, of needing to produce something and to do something to help um, right now um, while we're all facing this huge challenge around um, maintaining people's safety within uh, the context of COVID. Um, and so I guess that's where we, we're at. So our first test of change, as um, Emily's mentioned, we're going to do that recording today, later on, um, and then share that. Um, and then we will be testing out the, the reduced, new reduced context content um, next week with a, a small group um, from one of our hospitals so there will be our, our test there so to speak um, and we hope to take some learning from that um, uh, and I guess going forward we hope to to be able to see an increase in uptake we uh, want to definitely see an increase in the uptake of the uh, the other e-learning training um, and find ways to measure the impact of of this on the safety um, as perceived by, by the teams. So lots of work to do, lots of, lots of, I mean, we're very much at the early stages, so this is um, kind of where we're going with that. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks Emily and Tope. So if anybody's got any questions for Emily and Tope, please put them in the chat. Um, one of the things, I guess it's slightly different um, that Tope and Emily were saying to maybe what Elf are doing currently, and apologies guys at Elft if I've got this wrong, um, is around the pre-recorded session. And I think one of the things that we're really mindful of, especially with the clinical training, is that our, we know that at the minute our wards are really stretched. Um, we know that our clinic, you know, clinical staff are being redeployed out of corporate roles into clinical roles, etc. cetera. Um, and we know they're facing completely different pressures to normal. Um, so actually by having it pre-recorded with the opportunity to have the, the call to connect and reflect on it allows people to be able to watch it when they can um, as opposed to a specific set time etc. So there's benefits definitely to both but that's one of the things with it being a clinical course is trying to make sure that we can get it out to our 
to our clinical teams um, as soon as possible um, because we know that there's a with COVID-19 there's a potential increased risk to with death by suicide um, so that's one of those things I was recent I can't remember what it was I was listening to um, but basically they were talking about the pros of virtual training and being able to even listen, listen to training on your commute to work um, or when you're traveling somewhere or if you're going for a walk or a run or a jog etc and so I suppose that podcast style helps suit that so we're testing it out equally but not necessarily an improvement course as such so um, as I said any questions for the guys from Elft any questions for Tope and Emily please put them in the chat and um, there's already conversations happening about that so thank you all so much for engaging um, the next thing I'm going to do is just share my screen and pass over to Lou who hopefully is with us um, Lou you're going to need to direct me on when you want me to zoom in and out um, is everybody able to see a fishbone diagram? Um, hi everyone, um, I'm from Gloucester and I've been, I sort of came into this through um, a discussion with Amy from the Royal Free on Twitter and we started having a few small group discussions about what online virtual training might look like. Um, very quickly we started looking at the obvious challenges of how do we do driver diagrams how do we do pdsa how do we what platforms are we using and we got i, I think we got quite involved in the technology side and also the um the um interactive delivery side so I had a discussion yesterday with helen bevan as the, if anyone's done any of the NHS Horizons webinars and things that they do, you'll know they're very good at it. Um, so I thought we'd go and find out a bit more about what they know. And her first thought was actually we need to look at the psychology of learning design. So it's not just about the technology, it's not just about the exercises. Actually, we need to think first of all, who are our people? And that's who are our people involved in the project of what we're doing, but also who are our people that we're delivering to? And what do we need to consider about them um, in terms of IT literacy, in terms of Wi-Fi speeds, in terms of have they got um, accessibility of whatever software we use? Has everybody got a laptop with a webcam and a microphone? So actually starting to think about all those different elements that maybe we hadn't thought about before. Emma, can you just scroll to the left, please? Thank you. So we started off um, started off this driver diagram yesterday, and it's very, very much a first draft. Um, and I'm very open to people throwing in suggestions in the chat box if you can see anything missing that you think is something obvious we should add in. Um, in Gloucester, we run three different levels of training. So we run a, a half day introductory QI training. Um, then we run a six month project based training and we also run coaching training. And I've been tasked with turning all of those into virtual training, um, probably starting with some of our shorter monthly sessions. So started off with the fishbone to kind of think what are all the things that we actually need to consider when we're going into this so around communications um, there'll be additional stuff that as um, the team at Elf said about how the technological um, information we need to share with teams prior to the training um, and making sure that people know how to use things. I think I've learned again from being on calls with NHS Horizons, they always have backup presenters, they always have someone monitoring the chat. Um, Helen said something really interesting that I hadn't thought about because we tend to think of breakout rooms in terms of activities but actually she was talking about you can put people in breakout rooms as soon as they come into the session and actually get them to start talking about ideas such as you know why are you here where are you from where do you work and doing that general networking that you'd actually get in a real world environment in a room so starting to think about how we can mimic that kind of things. Um, looking at the time, would we still deliver a four hour session or would we look at delivering four one hour sessions? And also, do we need to add in extra time for that networking to allow people to make those connections? And how do we keep those connections then moving in the chat throughout it? So if anyone's interested, um, I can share this fishbone. We've talked a bit in the chat about having a special interest group around virtual learning, virtual training. Um, so if that's set up, we can share this and I'm sure Emma can send it out anyway. Um, 
it is very much first draft. In Gloucester, we're also looking at working um, not just as a QI team, but with our OD team and our finance team and all our other training delivery. So really starting to think about what do we all need together and not so much the content, but how do we deliver training? And starting from that perspective, how do we deliver training and what are our core needs in order to do that? And then moving on. And I think ideally, um, Zoom is probably the ideal platform, but then looking at some of the other options for interactivity. So Miro, which has been talked about in the chat, is what I created this fishbone in. Um, you can also do driver diagrams in there. You can do um, process maps in there. And um, it's all interactive. So you can have multiple people working on that in the same time in um, potentially in a breakout room. So if you had 20 people, put them into five breakout rooms with five blank um, fish bones or driver diagrams, get them to work on it. And then either feedback through a nominated um, person or feedback through screen sharing and someone talking it through. So th there was lots of different options that I think I hadn't thought about prior. Um, as I said, this is very early stage, so please do contribute to it because this was my, my Thursday afternoon in the garden yesterday. Um, but I've also shared some links in the chat. The NHS Horizons team have done um, a programme called Virtual Collaborate where they've tested lots and lots of different platforms and, and sort of explored what their capabilities are. And one of the links I shared earlier takes you to a whole host of resources about virtual training. There's a free online book you can download um, because of, um, I'm losing my words now, but there's a free online book you can download. There's different options, of different software. So Mural, other things, um, Google Jamboard. Um, we had a bit of an explore of Google Jamboard and it seemed that you could only, again, it's similar to similar whiteboard kind of software. Seems it's only editable through having a Google account and you can only view it if you've got an NHS account. So that, that wasn't something that we could try. Um, same as everyone else struggling with the PDSA concept. So again, think about um, any sharing. <laughs> I think we can all we can all share on that one. Um, but I think I won't talk about it too much because it is quite small and it's probably quite boring to talk through it all in detail. But I will send it out. If anyone's got any questions, obviously just shout me up in the chat box. Thank you. Great, thanks Lou. And it may be that the exercise we're going to do in a second with the driver diagram, um, we're going to use chat because we thought it might be, we're obviously doing PDSAs and didn't want to test out too much in the conversation, um, but we're going to do it via chat, but what we're going to do is save the chat so I can turn it into a force field analysis which we can share with you afterwards. So it may be actually a lot from that Lou will feed into your fishbone or maybe actually duplication of your fishbone so we'll be able to find out. Okay, so here we go, another screen share and test. Let's see if this works. Okay, fab. Okay, so I think I was a little bit ambitious with time and trying to fit everything into the time that we had. So I'm going to run a, my own PDSA. And I think because virtual training is obviously a really hot topic and from the chat, so many people are interested in working on it and focusing on it. I'm gonna carry on with the force field analysis exercise. But the networking side of things, there are a couple of different topics um, available, um, well, that came up from the registration. Um, and I'm going to suggest that maybe at towards the end, if we, I'll leave five minutes towards the end for us to connect on that. And if people put in the chat, if any of the topics are things they would like another call on, we can set up calls specific for those, um, like we have today for virtual training. Um, and also in terms of the networking connection, please connect amongst yourselves. Um, feel free to connect outside of, side of the calls, feel free to connect on Twitter, etc., so that we can keep this connection going. And we will work better with, well, I'll work better with timekeeping and not have such a um, crammed full agenda for the next call so that we can save some of that, that time going forward. Okay, so the force field analysis, what many of you may be familiar with this tool as we're all improvers, um, but just for those that aren't, I've put a very brief definition of what it is. Um, so it's basically a way of looking at um, together the positive forces for change. So what's going to really help the change happen? What's going to drive it forward? What's going to help us achieve what we want to achieve? Um, 
and the restraining forces are what are our obstacles what are our challenges what are our blockers they are often opposites of each other as you can imagine a driving force will probably have a restraining force but that's not always the case um, and basically to achieve successful change or to make change happen we need to be weakening and removing the restraining forces overcoming them um, finding out what we need to do to to um, overcome the challenges and strengthening the driving forces so it's a it's a bit of a battle between the two and trying to get the balance right but it's it's definitely I think I've said this before to some of you know my old colleagues will know but it's definitely one of my favorite tools which is why I've probably gone to putting it in this call um, I think it's absolutely fantastic um, okay so what I'd like you guys to do is focus, we're going to focus on the driving forces to so be positive first um, so in terms of turning training into a virtual course, developing a virtual course. Um, it could be the things around the actual course itself. It could be things around the process in terms of the software, the technology, the platform, like um, Francisco and Shubs were sharing earlier. Um, what are some of the driving forces that you guys are experiencing or feel would be a driving force going forward for you? Um, please feel free to add them into the chat. We can obviously all see them within the chat, but then we will put it together um, into a force field analysis afterwards, which we'll share after the call. So I'm just going to pause for a few moments to let you guys engage in the activity. So you guys are probably seeing them flowing in really, really fast. I'm trying to keep up with them as fast as I can. Um, there's a lot about flexibility. Um, many of us probably work in really in trusts that are really geographically dispersed. I know in Surrey we are, um, and we are, I guess, our go-to means of transport is the M25. So you can imagine that it can take quite a long time to get um, between meetings and often can be impossible if there's an accident or a block or a road shut in that so that's definitely one thing is it really allows people to connect that way um it also will allow people to connect from different roles who are geographically dispersed that wouldn't you know be able to come together um so that's one of them there's definitely something um about interesting point from peter around the difference between introverts and extroverts using the chats um peter are you happy to unmute your, mute yourselves and talk about that a little bit more your thoughts around that Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, well, sorry, good afternoon. Um, yeah, um, I'm, as an introvert, um, trying to be an extrovert uh, myself. I really appreciate that um, sometimes you can really lo lose stuff because the introverts don't, don't want to talk in a room. Um, and I think this is the equivalent of uh, allowing sort of nominal group technique to actually bring out sort of ideas is, is a good way of doing it but actually that the chat does the same thing for you because you if you as long as you are um thorough in terms of going through everybody's um questions on the chat you've allowed everybody to have their say or every time everybody to bring up what they want or ask what they want so um that's what i mean by it being a, a real leveler great thank you and i think this is a demonstration of the the power of us doing stuff as a group because that's definitely not something that if I was doing this myself as a force field analysis that's not something that would come to mind um so yeah that's absolutely fantastic um really really good point um there's people have said different things around actually it means that we're not excluding people that are having to shield at the moment or isolate for whatever reason so it means that they're still able to have the same access and the same engagement which is a really really good point um one of the things that i know that i've been reflecting on i don't know whether this will come up in the 
um, force analysis from a positive side or a negative side is there's a lot of focus at the minute about how we um, make our existing training a virtual offer and the simplest way of doing that would be to simply just deliver it via a video call or via a webinar or whatever but I think there's definitely I know we've spoken already about the, um, the special interest group something about what people need at the moment and so many people are doing improvement work without even realizing they are and how do we really um, open up the access to tool improvement tools that could assist them and help them with that and um, so that's one of the things that's definitely that's definitely being support for me um, the flexibility theme is definitely there the um, reducing travel time the scale up and actually the number of people that you can reach um, and I know that earlier in the presentations there was a discussion about whether um, it would we would get few, like less engagement but it seems that actually possibly the opportunity is fantastic um somebody said a wider audience um so yeah there's amazing comments so what i will do as i said is group them together um and put them into the driving forces meeting rooms I, that seems to be a theme everywhere i can't book enough meeting rooms or the right size meeting rooms to be able to deliver the training so there may be something about how we could do both so for example if you've got a um one of our say inpatient units we could they could all log in together, maintaining social distancing for, to, to watch the virtual training, for example. So you get the, the group with the, um, the virtual offer combined. So I think I've covered most of the points, but you guys can see them for yourselves in the chat. Um, Peter, your points got a lot of attention. People definitely agreeing with you. Um, okay, fantastic. So if we now move on to the restraining forces. So if guys, if we stop the, the comments about driving forces just so that I know which is the last one when we when we move on um, so if we move on to the restraining forces so many of them will probably be the opposites to the driving forces but there may be others that we've not actually thought about yet um, so what are some of the real obstacles and challenges that we are facing when in terms of making training virtual delivering virtual training um, the process of making it virtual what the, the training is the content etc you guys are the experts um, what are some of the challenges you're facing or some of the obstacles you predict you could face? So I'm just going to be quiet and allow the chat to flow. As the chat's going, there was a comment earlier about this. Um, it was quite a while ago. I think it was during the time that Elf, or it could have been when Tope was talking. Um, Penny, you mentioned around the landing of humour. Do you want to talk about that a little bit more? I don't know if Penny's still with us. I am, but I'm having some problems with child disruption, so um, <laughs> forgive me, it might be difficult to contribute right now. Okay, no problem. I think um, I think Emma on the on the, on the humour part, and I think um, yeah. it's something others were talking about as well. It's as we're testing and learning, and actually uh, making mistakes, and sometimes it, I think it links to um, the point around confidence as well. So sometimes your confidence can feel, can feel a bit battered, but actually supporting one another and doing this together and, and finding solutions as well. And when you're working with a group of peers and um, you know everyone's got your back and everyone everyone's behind you but it's it's quite hard to remember that when you're panicking because you can't remember the button that you're supposed to be pressing or or it's completely logged you off and your screen's not working um and, and that you know the, the palms get slightly sweaty don't they um but ha being so being able to, to have a laugh about that but also bringing in some fun into how you how you land in the space because sometimes when you go to an event you're whilst you're traveling there you might be reading some papers on the train or you might be thinking about where you're going to but often we're just walking across the kitchen to our event which is on our laptop so how do we how do we come into that space um, and how do we settle settle people in when when they're coming in as well and often doing that in a fun way can just help everyone relax yeah absolutely and I remember when I first started teaching and training many years ago um, I found it really nerve-wracking and I remember one of the things that definitely really helped me was 
finding my allies in the room to finding those couple of smiley faces that would nod or smile or give you eye contact to reassure you that you know you you're doing okay um and that's quite difficult with video calls um it's quite difficult to for example with zoom at the moment i can only see four people so how do i know whether actually people are looking at their computers doing emails or on their phones or actually have frowned at something i've said so i think there's definitely how you get that connection and keep that connection that the the real personal tactile connection um is definitely something so in the chat some of the comments um one of the I've just seen a recent one i think it's from nicola around um service user and carer involvement and people not always having technology to be able to engage in the training one of the um, things that has come up as actually an area that people would like to discuss is around service user care or patient engagement in the virtual world. So I think that's something that would definitely merit another call and a real, um, real in enough space to discuss it. Because I don't think we probably have enough time today, but I think it definitely would benefit some, some more time and some more thinking together. Um, people actually engage in it's very easy if you're on your computer to do something else at the same time on your computer. Um, it's a lot harder to be fully engaged. Um, other things that have come up, difficulty with measuring the pace, yeah, Francisco. Um, body language is a really effective past communication, absolutely, absolutely. Um, reading the room, we've spoken about that already. Um, how you control the energy and the personality. Technology is definitely a theme that's coming up um, a lot with everybody is actually, you know, people to be able to do virtual training, people need to be able to access it. And it may be that we as trainers and facilitators need to think about running sessions across a, a range of technology. So whether it's a podcast so people can listen to it, whether it's a video so people can watch it, whether it's an opportunity for people to dial into a call. Um, we actually... Um, our service user and carer forum recently via Zoom and we had some people calling in and some people on video so you know making sure that not remembering that not everyone's going to be able to see your screen if that's the case how do you get the information accessible to everybody um I was just trying to keep up with the chat difficulty in engaging the room um your own space to deliver it as well I think is something so your space to deliver and your space to join so as a facilitator there's um, you know, I've definitely told my partner he's not allowed to enter this room for the next 90 minutes. So how do you make sure that you're in the in the right environment as a facilitator so you've not got to worry about, about that? Or being really open, actually, and really transparent. And like Penny said, you know, I, there's a child in the room. My child's in the room. It's going to be difficult right now. And that, and that being okay, people are human. They, they're really kind. Um, the laggard fix, is it Ad Adeline? 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 Um, that's yeah that's a really interesting point actually that people can be really fixed about training needs to be face to face and feeling like it's not as good or the same if it's um delivered virtually um i don't know whether any of the those who are helping me on the chat have spotted anything different than what i'm getting through so far there's a really, really great point from Justin about um the engagement and that being a choice and it being you know as a participant you choose to to join something in it and you you make you need to make a, a choice about how how you want to be in that space and how you want to engage and and there's you know there's some online online pieces that really are um you're just taking in information and and there there is less less engagement but it's mm. it's it also comes down to the design and how you appeal to to people's interests as justin justin has said there as well um so some really insightful comments mm -hmm. Yeah, Emily's made a comment about um, people liking the day to escape. I think that's a really good point that actually people like to do training away from everything to be able to be present, like Justin saying, and you can, if you are going to a, you know, a training room that's away from your service or your, your train is being delivered in a nice venue, it does have a real impact on your experience. Um, and how do we keep that experience alive with doing virtual training? Because that's what we can do at the moment. Um, Interesting point from Oz. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Um, the inequalities point around some people who are left behind. I, I think I might have interpreted it differently to what you may have meant. Um, 
I think what we've what we've learned uh, as well is when you deliver training, uh, you know, there might be people with uh, visual impairments, hearing impairments, mm-hmm. and all those things. Um, so they're, they're different things, including what people have spoken about about people who might not have access to some of the technologies we're trying to use, especially with QI training, where you're trying to uh, use some collaborative tools as well. So in in addition to just logging in, viewing, and being heard, you also want them to interact. So maybe using Menti and other things. So the more you add, the more you the more people you start to leave behind uh, because mm. we're not as, as comfortable with those platforms. I think also I inter- so I interpreted that way, but another you made me think about the um, pace of learning and how um, people could be could fall behind in terms of the pace, but feeling open enough and safe enough to say, oh, actually, can you go back four slides because I need to go back to that. If you're in a classroom, you can see people around you and get a sense of whether people are ready to move on. But that's very difficult in a in a virtual world. So, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so looking at time, which I've not been, oh dear, I've not been very good at time today. Um, so just moving on, what, like I said, I'm going to be putting together the force field analysis from the chat, which we will share with you guys. So hopefully that can help you in your journey with virtual training development or PDSAs. So when, we, when you guys registered for the call, we asked you, there was a couple of questions about what you're working on, etc. But one of the questions was, what would you like to connect about and what would you like to discuss? And this was going to be our time to network, but unfortunately, virtual training is definitely a hot topic and took over the call, rightly so. Um, so we will need to find some of this time to have these conversations again. So I'd be really keen from the people that are on the chat, because we didn't get answers from everybody. Um, if we were to run another call in a couple of weeks, is there a topic that's in the bubbles or on your mind that you'd really like us to focus on? One of the ones that's come up quite a lot and had a lot of comments um, in the registration was around the connecting with service users, patients and carers and how we connect with them in improvement work, improvement teams, if that's coaching being done virtually, but also in training um, side of things. And like Oz mentioned a minute ago, um, not disadvantaging anyone, um, making sure we're inclusive and meet, meeting everyone's needs and accessibility. Um, so that's definitely one of them. So yeah, I'd be really keen to know if there's, if you'd like another call and um, if we were to facilitate one, if there's a particular topic that you'd like to focus on, because then we can make connections with different um, colleagues and improvers to find people that have maybe already tested some ideas around that area to share their learning like we've done today. Um, so A, feel free to connect and network yourselves around you know, any areas of topics, um, but it would be great for us to work out whether you'd like any further calls and um, what you'd like to focus on. And as we've mentioned already, we will be sending around the recording of this one. Um, the We may be able to send around, the, I've seen a comment around, a, oh dear, don't want them to change, sorry guys. Too mouse heavy. Um, we may be able to send around the recording of the first one um, but we did that one from our Surrey and Borders account before we have connected with Q, so it may not be as easy. Um, but um, Joy wrote a lovely blog on it, so we can send the blog, I think, is on the Q website, as far as I'm aware, which summarises the call and the different things we spoke about. So please feel free to um, have a read of the blog. She summarised it really, really well. Um, it's really kind. So yeah, connecting service users is definitely a session that people would like to talk about. Um, playing with PDSAs, activities. That's definitely, I think, something that the special interest group would be able to pick up from this as well. And yeah, more comments about the restarting QI. That was definitely something that was um, discussed at the beginning of the call and people introducing themselves around actually they're in a process of um, reactivating, not hibernating as I said earlier, um, reactivating their improvement programs and support to improvement projects and what that looks like and actually a lot of that may need to be virtual in the interim so how can we use our learning from virtual training to support that um, and you may have seen earlier in the chat Amy shared on Twitter um, a great picture of a slide around the workshops that they're doing at Royal Free, which is offering improvement workshops to teams, um, as well as obviously the training, but actually bringing the, the tool to the team based on the problem that they're working on or the thing that they need help with, which I think is a great approach. 
Okay, so mindful of time. Um, please add the things you'd like to focus on in the chat. And I just wanted to say a massive thank you for joining the call. I can't believe how many participants participants we had. It was fantastic. Thank you all for the comments and the engagement that you've had. Um, a big thank you to Francisco, Marco, Nicola and Shubs. Um, lovely to see you again and thank you for sharing your presentation um, about Pocket QI. Thank you to Tope and Emily for sharing their learning around suicide um, prevention training and to Lou for um, putting together the fishbone so quickly and sharing that in so well on the call. That was really, really great. So yeah, um, it's now 12.30. So thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon and speak to you very soon.